This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. In this edition of the Onkazine Brief, we talk with Dr. Nader Sanai. Dr. Sanai is an internationally recognized neurosurgical oncologist with clinical and research expertise in the treatment of all brain tumors. He is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Onkazine Brief. The Ivy Brain Tumor Center offers a bold approach to identify new and effective therapies for malignant brain tumors, including glioblastoma, the most aggressive cancer that begins within the brain. Dr. Senai is the principal architect of the center's accelerated clinical trials program, the largest in the world. Together with a multidisciplinary team, Dr. Senai specializes in identifying new first-in-class therapeutic agents that match the individual biologies of brain tumor patients. In this approach, patients receive individualized care in a fraction of the time and cost associated with traditional research and development. Unlike conventional clinical trials that focus on a specific drug, the accelerated trial is designed to discover therapy combinations for individual patients, and these include patients with the most aggressive brain tumors. The Oncozine Brief is developed in collaboration with our online journal Oncozine at oncozine.com where you can find additional information and the latest news about cancer, cancer diagnosis and treatment, and cancer prevention. Let's listen to our interview with Dr. Nader Sanai. Here with me uh, in his office is Dr. Nader Sanai. We're going to talk a little bit about the Ivy Brain Research Center and about uh, what he's doing here. I'll talk a little bit about glioblastoma, one of the diseases that he is involved with in treating, and a lot of different things associated with his organization. Dr. Nader, welcome to the Onkosin Brief. Thanks very much. Appreciate the opportunity. So let's start a little bit with your background. You are an international recognized neurosurgical oncologist, but how did you get here? Well, so as you said, I'm a neurosurgeon. I've been in practice for almost 10 years now. Um, The road began many years ago when my mother's sister passed away from a glioblastoma, which is one of the brain cancers that we'll talk about. And at that time, I was much younger, and I saw the devastation that that disease wreaks onto a family, the incredible despair and uncertainty. But I also saw at that time, the stabilizing force that a neurosurgeon could provide in those chasms. And it was in observing our family's response to her neurosurgeon, a man named Dr. Eugene Stern, who was the chair of neurosurgery at UCLA at the time, that I realized that even in these desperate moments, there can be individuals that really bring a degree of stability. I think that planted a seed in my mind later on when I found myself in college in San Diego at UC San Diego. I sought out a neurosurgeon there, the chair of that program named Lawrence Marshall. Dr. Marshall was one of my early mentors as well and really helped guide me towards medical school. And within medical school at UCSF in San Francisco, I encountered one of the finest neurosurgical programs in the world and their chairman, Dr. Mitchell Berger. And it was really my mentorship relationship with Dr. Berger that introduced me to neurosurgical oncology, him being one of the preeminent neurosurgical oncologists in the world. And ultimately, after completing that training program, I moved on to Phoenix, Arizona at the Barrow Neurological Institute. And that was a very deliberate choice, one that was driven by, obviously, discussions with my mentors, but more importantly, the desire to help be part of building a world-class brain tumor program from the ground up and understanding that a world-class brain tumor program is a combination of clinical and scientific resources. Science, as I was advised by some of my mentors, is really something that can be built in any location with the right right direction, resources, and vision. But clinical material, and specifically the patient population, is really a function of demographics. It's not something that's very mutable. And at any given center, the population center is what it is. 
So growing that population is no easy feat, and most centers not really something that's practical. So coming to a region like Phoenix, where there's such a massive patient population, and a center like the Barrow, which is the highest volume operative brain tumor center in the world, one of the highest volume neurosurgical centers in the world. And, and patients come from not only from the Phoenix and Arizona area, they come from California, they come from other areas as well? Correct. Obviously, the states around Arizona rely upon us heavily. But even beyond that, we have a national and international draw. The center has been here for 50 years. It's really regarded within the field as one of the pinnacles of technical excellence within neurosurgery. And so as a consequence, patients come here for complex operations. Right. Now, you mentioned the IFE Brain Tumor Center. You also mentioned Barrow's Neurological Institute. Mm -hmm. And this is all part, again, with Dignity Health. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about the differences between the different organizations? Because I understand there is some difference. Yes. So the hospital complex that we are centrally part of is St. Joseph's Hospital Medical Center. That's one of the many hospitals within the national network of Dignity Health Hospital Systems. The Barrow Neurological Institute is a specialized neurological institute derived from a partnership with Dignity Health and St. Joseph's Hospital and really built to form a constellation of neurospecific clinical specialties with accompanying research efforts as well. The Ivy Brain Tumor Center is the newest addition to this triumvirate and is really autonomous effort to generate an early phase clinical trialing program for brain tumor patients specifically. So while we rely heavily on partnership with Dignity Health, partnership with the Barrow Neurological Institute, we also have a degree of independence from them that allows us to focus on an operational tempo that would be difficult to accomplish otherwise. So basically the organizations are really working in tandem with one another. They kind of operate together. That's right. They're basically a series of, uh, it's almost like a Venn diagram of three overlapping concentric circles. Right. How does that um, benefit patients? From a patient standpoint, especially if you're grappling with brain cancer, as my loved ones have and others have as well, what you really want is a combination of excellent clinical care. But in addition to that, you really want cutting edge research and particularly translational research. Mm -hmm. You want to be at a program and center that not only has experience with the disease, but also sees where the forefront of its development is and gets you those drugs. So when, when you talk about translational research, that's, tell me a little bit about that. Sure. So when we talk about research in general, we think of it as, for example, basic science research, which would be purely laboratory-based research, asking fundamental questions of basic biology. Or we can think of it on the other end of the spectrum as clinical research, where we already have a clinical concept in mind and we're trying to test clinical theories in patients. Translational research is really the intersection of these two, where you're performing laboratory-based research, but with a near-term goal to get it into the patient realm and to impact patients directly. And that's what we call in the field translation. Right. And that is what happens here. That's exclusively what happens here. All of the research we perform at the Ivy Center is focused entirely on getting new therapies to patients. We think that the efforts at understanding the basic biology of brain tumors, for example, is critical and is something that has performed excellently at many centers around the world. But what we feel we can contribute to the field and to the patient community is the ability to take those basic translations and really move them into the clinical court of patients in the form of therapies and trials. Now, you also were talking about uh, in our conversation that we had before the program uh, started. We were talking a little bit about the different modalities in, in treating, for example, a disease like glioblastoma, which is a, a brain cancer. You said there is surgery, there is uh, drug therapy, um, there's radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. One of the things that stood out for me was the fact that all the other modalities, including surgery, they were really on a high level. They are basically performed and, and, and it is very hard to improve on, on, on those operations or, or those ways of treating people. One thing is lacking and that is drug therapy. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I agree with you completely. A patient that encounters a brain tumor and themselves or a loved one is really faced with these three levels of intervention. They're oftentimes going to go through a brain tumor operation first, oftentimes with a surgeon like myself. And then they're going to meet a radiation oncologist and go through some form of radiotherapy. And as you alluded to, surgical techniques today and radiotherapy techniques today are really as advanced as they've ever been. 
we've really maximized these two modalities. But the third level to their treatment is almost inevitably going to be some form of drug therapy, medication therapy, chemotherapy. And that's really where there is tremendous upside in terms of the room for improvement that we have within the field. Currently today, in the last 30 years, there have only been five drugs specifically approved for some form of brain cancer or brain tumor. That's a very, very low number compared to other cancer types like, for example, lung cancer or breast cancer, where there have been upwards of 50 drugs developed and approved by the FDA in the last 30 years for those indications. So we know there's a lot of work here to be done, and this is what the Ivy Center is about, accelerating that work and getting new drugs into patients. Let's take a break. After the break, we're back with Dr. Nader Sanai. Dr. Sanai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. He is also the principal architect of the center's Accelerated Clinical Trials Program, the largest in the world. Each day, researchers make discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Their progress is made possible with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosine Brief. If you're just joining us, today in the Oncosine Brief, we talk with Dr. Nader Sanai. Dr. Sanai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. He is also the principal architect of the Center's Accelerated Clinical Trials Program, the largest in the world. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosine Brief. Dr. Sanai. Before the break, uh, we were talking a little bit about the Ivy Brain Tumor Center. We, talk, we were talking a little bit about uh, the Barrows uh, Neurological Institute, about uh, Dignity Health, about the differences and the collaboration. If you um, look at the collaboration from an operational excellence, you mentioned that there are also differences in, in the way you can operate efficiently because mm-hmm. you have those three different entities. That's right. When you think about developing a a clinical trialing program, you you understand immediately that that includes partnership with the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. Today in 2019, development of drugs is firmly in the court of the industry, um, and no longer is it something that's necessarily controlled through academic medical centers, universities. These are extremely expensive endeavors, upwards of a billion to a billion and a half dollars per drug. Uh, upwards of a decade or so per drug. So the investment is huge. And as a consequence, these companies rightfully so want to protect their investment for themselves and their shareholders as they endeavor in developing these drugs. For many academic medical centers and universities, this manifests in the form of complicated legal proceedings between the two entities. Even though they both may want the same things, they're each trying to represent their perspective. This can slow down drug development substantially. And for those of us in the field, we understand that even when we have an outstanding concept and willing partners, it can be six months, a year or more before that partnership is really solidified in a contract. We designed the Ivy Center really to sidestep a lot of these landmines that exist naturally in the terrain. And so that includes having our own independent counsel that's not beholden to any specific university or academic medical center's policies but really just beholden to us and our motivations to develop new drugs for patients. So our intellectual property policy, for example, is extremely transparent and simple. We effectively ask nothing of the companies. We simply ask them for their drug, but no other form of financial support. And we allow them to keep all of the intellectual property from the work, as long as we have the ability to publish the data freely. And those really are the terms of our relationships. So in building the Ivy Center, we designed a system that enables us to do this. And this is, I think, what sets it apart 
for many other translational and cancer science research programs in the U.S. Now, you mentioned about compensation, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you don't mm -hmm. take anything from the, the drug developers or the, the drug companies. That is a distinction with other organizations. That's right. It's a distinction that we're blessed to have. And the funding for the Ivy Center is a, a combination of funding from the Ben and Catherine Ivy Foundation, which is the largest non-governmental funder of brain tumor research in the world, and the Barrow Neurological Foundation, which is the nonprofit arm of the Barrow Neurological Institute, where we are. This funding amounts to $50 million, and that really enables us to free ourselves from dependence on the industry for that funding. Funding from the industry doesn't always imply that one is beholden to the industry, but at the same time, whenever an outside entity is supporting research, it comes with strings attached, even if it's just in the form of um, the logistics of arriving at that funding. This funding enables us to move with, again, a, a tempo that you wouldn't be able to accomplish otherwise. And of course, it simplifies all of the discussions, because if we go to a prospective pharmaceutical partner and we propose to them a specific development course for their molecule, and we relay to them that not only will we, be, will we be not asking for any intellectual property, but at the same time, we'll be paying for the study itself and performing it at an extremely high volume clinical center where the study can get done in months, not years. We really leave very few reasons for them not to partner with us. And that's what we want for this patient population. Yeah, and when you when you look at, for example, trials, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it takes some time to actually get a contract between an organization off the ground to make that happen, to make that relationship solidify the relationship in that respect. But the trials in itself are also long. Correct. I mean, you look at translational research uh, that may take years. That's right. Give give me an indication, please. Well, our approach to trialing is slightly different. We. Uh, adapt a system called phase zero clinical trialing. Conventional clinical trialing is really predicated on the concept of taking a drug on faith. A patient has a disease, they've run out of standards of care, a new drug is identified, the patient then receives that drug, and then the patient is followed for weeks or months in a, in a brain tumor patient's case, gets repeat MRI scans, and then we make an assessment based on the MRI scans or how long the patient lived as to whether the drug helped or didn't help. But that assessment is very much indirect. It doesn't tell us specifically what the drug did for the patient, if anything at all. With phase zero clinical trials, what you're trying to understand is whether the drug is actually having activity in an individual patient, and you're trying to understand that question quickly. So that if a drug is promising, we know that within months. And if a drug is not promising, we also know that within months. So we like to fail fast, but succeed quickly as well. So that means that uh, in, indeed you speed up the drug development process. We think so, because what it does, and, and this is what I relay to our partners in industry, is that it helps us go through their drug portfolio or pipeline and identify which drugs should be accelerated for development and have real promise and which drugs do not. How does that work f with, for example, combination therapies, where you look at one drug versus another drug or a standard of care versus the, a trial drug? Well, combination therapies are really the heart of what we're going for here. In this disease, with respect to brain cancer in particular, we've had very little success with monotherapies. So getting a drug cocktail is essential. But arriving at cocktails is a complicated matter, especially if you have drugs from different companies that you're trying to combine. The Ivy Center really facilitates that process because we've simplified the contracting piece. We've simplified the trial accrual piece, which is what you're referring to in terms of the speed of the trial. Mm -hmm. And because we have expertise in this type of trial design. So we're able to sort of grease the wheels and get cocktails together from companies that may be competitors in the marketplace, but both very much have the same interests in mind, and we help facilitate that. And then in the way you do your research, you can distinguish between the part of the combination drug which works and which does not work, also in an expedited version? Exactly. So if you look at the field of drug development for brain cancer, there are two primary reasons why drugs typically fail. The first is that the drugs simply do not arrive at the brain tumor because the brain is designed to keep things out. So that's called CNS or brain tumor penetration. The second issue is frankly that the drugs don't do in patients what we expect them to do based on the research in the laboratory on animals. So creating an animal model that gives you a responsible picture of what's going to happen in patients is a very challenging thing to, to, to do. You can do it effectively with other cancers, 
melanoma, for example, Mm -hmm. breast cancer, lung cancer, have excellent animal models that are predictive of what happens in patients. But for brain cancer, that hasn't been the case. So we answer these two very simple questions in these trials. Did the drug get there? And did it modulate its target the way it's supposed to? And if we have a cocktail, we ask those same two questions of each individual member of that cocktail. And that ultimately leads to a drug approval? Well, what it ultimately leads to is a fast track towards drug approval. Because if and when we arrive at an effective cocktail, we then have really direct evidence, not indirect evidence, that it should work. We then rapidly accelerate that into a randomized study and try to get through the regulatory process in a responsible way. But again, that takes a number of years? It can take years. It all depends on a number of different factors, but certainly the whole system is designed to accelerate a process. It still takes time, but for us to be at the point where we're at randomization is a critical checkpoint. And that means that patients may come in different phases of their disease? Does that make a difference um, when you look at the diagnosis part of a patient? Is there a difference in in what kind of patients you can in use for trial? Yes. So our selection process for patients is one of the most critical things we do. One of the challenges within cancer patients of the brain is that no two patients are alike. Even patients with the same diagnosis, biologically and genetically, have very different diseases. So as we'll talk about in, in a short period of time, glioblastoma, which is one of the most common brain cancers we encounter, something that Senator Kennedy, uh, Senator McCain had, is not similar from patient to patient. So when we select patients for trials, we don't just look at their diagnosis. We do in-depth genetic and other types of analyses of their specific tissue to then match them to the drug or drug mechanisms that we think are most suitable for them. And that's how that matchmaking happens. Tell me a little bit about this disease, because I understand it is a very difficult to treat disease. Um, It's not necessarily always recognized as this is glioblastoma immediately at at, uh, at face value. Tell me a little bit about the complexities of this disease. So glioblastoma is the most common, what we call primary brain cancer that we encounter, meaning a, a cancer that's coming from the brain tissue itself. It doesn't have any real socioeconomic boundaries It doesn't have any known environmental factors to cause it. It often afflicts patients who are otherwise healthy. It can afflict patients who are relatively young in their 30s and 40s, but also patients who are on the older side in their 60s and 70s. The disease itself can present in a variety of different ways. The most common presentation symptoms are headache, seizures, and what are called focal neurological deficits or stroke-like symptoms. But those symptoms are not necessarily something that has to do with glioblastoma. You have also other forms of disease, whatever it may be, I mean, that really have similar kind of uh, symptoms, right? Correct. Unfortunately, those diseases are far more prevalent. So the most common cause of headache in the United States is a migraine, mm-hmm. not a brain tumor, fortunately. By the same token, a seizure can be caused by an underlying seizure disorder or a drug exposure, not a brain tumor. And focal neurological deficits most commonly present accompanying a stroke, which is not a brain tumor. So it's important for patients to be educated on the spectrum of possibilities, but not overreact. And of course, if they have symptoms like these that are acute, that they present to their physician or emergency room and get a proper evaluation. Ultimately, the diagnosis of a glioblastoma is made in the operating room. But it begins with an MR scan, a magnetic resonance imaging scan, and that really gives us an idea that there is something structurally amiss in the brain, and that typically then leads to an introduction to a physician like myself, a neurosurgeon, who will then discuss the risks and benefits of performing an operation to remove it. Let's take a short break here, and then we talk some more about the Ivy Brain Tumor Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, with Dr. Nader Sonai. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic, safe, effective, even money saving, just like FDA approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. 
Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit FDA.gov slash generic drugs. Generics are safe, effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. Welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Ongezin Brief. If you're just joining us, today in the Ongezin Brief, we talk with Dr. Nader Sanai. Dr. Sanai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. He's also the principal architect of the center's Accelerated Clinical Trials Program, the largest in the world. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions about the glioblastoma. One of those misconceptions is the fact that surgery, I mean, which is your trade, which is uh, in itself cannot take away the entire glioblastoma. That's right. Surgery does not cure glioblastoma. And the reason for that is that it is not what we call a local disease. If you have breast cancer and it has not spread too far and it's caught early, an operation can be curative. The same with colon cancer. However, with glioblastoma, there are always little cells that you cannot see on the MRI. And so even an MRI scan after an operation that looks clean does not mean that you're not at risk for recurrence. And in fact, it's in most cases inevitable that there will be a recurrence. And this is why we have these other therapeutic modalities to treat those little cells that we can't see with our eye or on the MR scan and we can't remove with surgery. And those modalities are radiation, which targets an area of the brain beyond where we operate, and a chemotherapy, which typically bathes the entire brain in a medication that hopefully will fight those cells. Now, when you look again at um, uh, drug development in this case, many of the advanced drugs that are out there right now or are being tried in, in clinical trials, they require a lot of different testing, a lot of not only the diagnostic process, some of the things they may also need is campaign diagnostics. And mm. that's actually part of the diagnostic part, which will tell the doctor if that particular drug may actually work on a particular form of cancer or not. How is that in the treatment of glioblastoma? It's a great question. We haven't really seen the penetration of companion diagnostics in glioblastoma as we've seen in other cancers. So one example of what you're referring to is melanoma. Mm -hmm. Where, for example, if you have a BRAF mutation, that will imply that your tumor is particularly sensitive to certain immunotherapies. And the field has really been changed fundamentally by that pairing and introduction. For brain cancer, unfortunately, we haven't found too many mutations or genetic abnormalities that really predict a good response to a chemotherapy. We do have one, which is called MGMT methylation. And if you have that biomarker, you're more likely to be sensitive to ke the chemotherapy temozolomide and to radiation. But the implication is slightly different because in these other cancer types, the tr treating physicians have a choice of multiple FDA-approved medications to try. And the right. question really is, how do you match the right medication to the right patient? So that's really the, the paradigm of personalized medicine. For brain cancer and neuro-oncology, we don't really have a true actuation of that paradigm because we don't have the many choices of medications at hand. In fact, for glioblastoma, there's only one medication that's really considered to be a first-line medication, that's temozolomide. And beyond that, you've already exited the standard of care. So the field is working hard to identify these pairings, but from our perspective, what you need to succeed at that is an array of drugs that could and will work in some cases. And that's what we're searching hard to find. Now, that is talking about the standard of care and, and, and move on to clinical trials. If you look in the media around us, very often on the television, the newspapers, uh, magazines, there is a lot to do about immuno-oncology. Uh, we just had, um, when this program is uh, being broadcast, um, a very interesting meeting, the AACR, the American Association of Clinical Research. There's a, a lot of new developments, many new developments in immuno-oncology. How is that going to help? Now, first of all, how, what is immuno-oncology where you are? And how is that going to help the treatment of patients with glioblastoma? So immuno-oncology refers to strategies designed to co-opt 
the patient's immune system to help fight against the cancer. In some cases, accelerating the immune system. In some cases, removing the breaks from the immune system. And so you hear um, a lot today for other cancers in regards to not only what are called cancer vaccines, which prime your immune system against your cancer, but also checkpoint inhibitors, which accelerate the immune system against your cancer. That's had tremendous positive influence in other cancer types. Lung, some subtypes of lung cancer and skin cancer come to mind for that. It's really been paradigm shifting. Within brain cancer, however, we just haven't seen that level of impact yet. It's still early in the genesis of these concepts. And so there are many groups, including ours, working on these challenges. But one of the fundamental components to the challenge is the fact that the brain itself is a relatively immune-privileged site where the immune system doesn't have as much operational leeway as it does outside of the brain. And the brain cancer itself, like glioblastoma, is inherently an immunosuppressive entity. And so these tumors are called immunologically cold tumors as compared to immunologically hot tumors, like some of the ones I mentioned, where they can really rev up an immune system on their own. So for all these reasons, we think immunotherapies haven't really borne out the fruit for brain cancer as we would have liked to see at this point, but it's still early days. It does mean, however, that we have to be casting a wide net in terms of the possibility of different therapies for these types of patients. That complexity is something that you're dealing with here on a day-to-day basis, but there is also another complexity, and that is the misconceptions patients may have about brain tumors or or glioblastoma or anything else, and the fact that if they have a cancer that may metastasize or may have a spread to the brain, that that may not that is not a brain cancer. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about those misconceptions, and, and maybe there are more. Sure. So. Obviously, the concept of brain cancer is a very scary term. And cancer itself is a loaded term in and of itself. For many of us, we think of cancer as a tumor that is capable of spreading. So if you have breast cancer, it's not a benign nodule that if you remove will not come back. Breast cancer is a growth that has the ability to spread beyond the breast. Brain cancer itself, in its purest form, are tumors that are derived from the brain tissue itself. We call these, in more technical terms, primary brain tumors. Primary brain tumors, by and large, do not spread to outside of your brain. That's not the challenge with them. The challenge is their ability to spread inside the brain, the brain being an extremely sensitive organ that's difficult to treat without harming. We also have a term called secondary brain tumors. Secondary tumors are tumors that are arising from tissue outside of the brain. So, for example, breast cancer that spreads to the brain is called a brain metastasis. So we distinguish that from a primary brain tumor because that tumor is not derived from the brain tissue itself and controlling that tumor in general has as much to do with controlling what's in the breast as it does with controlling what's in the brain. I think that is a really good distinction for people to know that if a form of, if a cancer or tumor metastasizes and happens to be in the brain, it is not necessarily brain tumor. I think that is a, this distinction that people really want to know. That's right. Are there other misconceptions about this? Are there misconceptions about brain tumor, glioblastoma maybe, uh, that people are talking about that on the street, but are not accurate? Well, common questions we all get as we face this patient population are, what did I do to bring this on to myself? Um, for other cancer types, for example, some types of lung cancer, it can be environmental exposures, smoking, et cetera. For some types of skin cancer, it can be ultraviolet exposure. But what we try to counsel our patients is that th- there wasn't anything they did that led to this diagnosis. These are by and large spontaneous mutations that are occurring in their brain tissue. And we don't think that there's any pattern associated with them. A common concern, for example, is cell phone exposure. And there have been several large-scale multinational studies looking at cell phone exposure and concluding that there is no relationship between development of brain cancer or brain tumors and cell phone exposure. Often uh, you hear the suggestion um, that uh, it may cause brain cancer. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, certainly that's an important issue to address for the, for the public. Cell phones are ubiquitous today and the devices are up against the sides of our heads for for some people many hours a day. 
But we're fortunate that we've now had these devices for decades, and that gives the medical community a large population of data to analyze, and really to analyze it across different ethnicities, different socioeconomic backgrounds. When we've done that as a medical community, the studies that have been published have all concluded that there is no relationship. Intuitively, it makes sense that there is no relationship in, with respect to two observations. The first is that if cell phones were capable of being carcinogenic and causing cancer, one would really expect an increased incidence of skin cancer alongside the sides of our heads where these phones are before one would expect, for example, brain cancer deeper beneath the bone, which we don't see. The second observation is that one would expect brain cancer to really be geographically located in the brain, more commonly in the temporal lobes, where these cell phones are, are typically in closest proximity to. And we don't see that as well. And there have been a variety of other variables and covariables analyzed in conjunction with these. So we're confident in saying that it's not something the public needs to worry about today. And, and, and uh the, this is supported by a lot of um, studies. Um, I think the World Health Organization had a study done, um, and, and many organizations, probably your own organization, is also involved in the research and the data that comes out of that. It, I think it's a good thing for people to realize that um, some of the stories being told on the street are not necessarily always accurate. Let's take a short break. After the break, we're back with our interview with Dr. Nader Sanai. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Young Gassim Brief. Each day, researchers make discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Their progress is made possible with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Alcazin Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. Welcome back. I'm Peter Hoffman and this is the Alcazin Brief. If you're just joining us, today in the Alcazin Brief we talk with Dr. Nader Sanai. Dr. Sanai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. He is also the principal architect of the Center's Accelerated Clinical Trials Program the largest in the world. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the future. And here at the uh, Ivy Center's um, Cancer Center, there is a lot of activity, a lot of interesting plans, a lot of interesting developments uh, that are going on. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, the Ivy Center formally opened in spring of 2018. This is truly a multidisciplinary, multi-platform effort. I mentioned our purpose is really to develop early phase clinical trials for brain cancer patients. And the way we do that is through a phase zero trials program. These programs are designed to answer two important questions for individual patients. And these patients are matched to specific drug cocktails. And then we ask whether the drugs have penetrated the tumor and modulated their target. In order to be able to do this in a high throughput way, we've designed the IV Center both from an architectural organizational standpoint, but also from a scientific standpoint to really focus in lockstep with our objectives. As we walked around the center earlier, you could see sort of the beehive of activity within the clinical floors, our dedicated neurosurgical operating rooms, and also the, the laboratories and translational research spaces. We're in the process of, from ground up, remodeling our laboratory footprint so that it truly becomes this hybrid space where the basic scientists that are working on the real, what we call pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of these drugs are working alongside the clinical trialists and clinical research infrastructure that's really providing the framework within which we enroll these patients. We anticipate opening at least 10 new clinical trials within this calendar year alone. So our timetable is very ambitious and our partnerships with the industry is very diverse. And a lot of things is, you mentioned about uh, a new facility in that respect. Uh, it's still built in the old hospital. 
Uh, but there is, again, I mean, uh, walking on, through uh, some of the, the corridors, it's very exciting to see that there is a lot of activity and it's only going to increase. And, and, and pretty soon you're going to have brand new laboratories. How is this going to benefit clinical research in that respect? Because obviously when you develop that, um, there is a reason why you do that. That's right. So right now we have approximately 50 or so dedicated personnel just to the Ivy Center efforts alone, and we expect that to grow. You mentioned remodeling a laboratory space. It really is a delicate ballet because we have ongoing uh, efforts and trials at the same time as physical space remodeling and redesigning. Which, of course, is a big challenge. It is a big challenge, but one that we're up for and fortunately have planned very carefully. Um, Ultimately, the benefactor of all this effort are our patients. And when you're a patient facing this disease, it's comforting to know that people are working on your problem, but you don't have the luxury of time to wait for those answers for years. You have limited bites at the apple in terms of the different numbers of experimental therapies you can try before the disease starts to really push beyond the boundaries. We recognize that. And so all of our efforts are designed for very short turnover. A cl typical clinical trial for us will last about six months. What that lets us do is really within a very short period of time, oftentimes a single calendar year, identify whether a drug or drugs are promising and then accelerate them or pivot to others. And again, that's important because the, the, when glioblastoma hits someone, the disease is very aggressive. And at, at, at the, the time that people can be treated, is that, that window is very short. That's right. For glioblastoma, for example, the median survival in the United States is somewhere around 14 to 16 months, which is not a very long period of time. I mentioned that there is a standard of care, and that includes this drug temozolomide. But typically, patients will start to ev demonstrate evidence of recurrence, sometimes in less than a year after starting that drug. So you really have to move very quickly to the battle plan. And this is how we approach it at our center. This is an aggressive tumor. It pushes against us. So we're going to push back equally aggressively. And that includes surgery. It includes radiotherapy. And it includes then also the drug trials and also other drug op opportunities to develop new drugs in that respect. That's correct. It's not uncommon for patients with this disease to go through multiple rounds of surgery, multiple rounds of radiotherapy, and multiple different types of chemotherapy. Our job is to try to get through as many of these cycles as quickly as possible so that we can try different strategies on individual patients. We really see these diseases of brain cancer as not singular pies representing the disease, but individual slices of a pie. Each patient represents a different slice, a different combination of genetic abnormalities that we have to decipher and then find the right fit for. When we look ahead to how we think brain cancer is going to be treated in the future, we think that it's going to be highly individualized. Even a disease called glioblastoma will probably have 10, 20, upwards of 50 different subtypes, each maybe with their own therapeutic solution. Again, a lot of exciting things here. But what is the future, um, say, within the next five to 10 years uh, for glioblastoma? I mean, or patients being treated with glioblastoma. What are your expectations in that area? My expectation is that all of the investment within our nation and in the global community that we've placed in deciphering the genetics of this disease, the biology of this disease, will start to pay dividends. We know more about this disease today than we ever have by orders of magnitude. Now the heavy lifting comes in terms of taking this information and understanding how it applies on a patient-by-patient -patient level. The Ivy Center strategy is quite simple. We're looking for small digestible pieces of the disease to treat one fraction at a time. A concrete example of this would be a certain genetic mutation that occurs in 3 to 5% of these patients. Now, that's a, not a large number, but if we can find a druggable target for that combination and a treatment paradigm that works for that 3 to 5%, number one, that's progress like we haven't had before, and number two, that's how we're going to be climbing this ladder one rung at a time. And so there is good hope uh, that uh, their success in the next five to 10 years is only going to be bigger. We're, we're very optimistic, yes. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosin Brief. The Ivy Brain Tumor Center Precision Medicine Program is the first of its kind in neuro-oncology. 
The center was founded by $50 million grant from the Ben and Catherine Ivey Foundation, the largest non-government organization supporter of brain tumor research in the world. For more information about the Ben and Catherine Ivey Foundation, please visit the foundation's website at ivyfoundation.org. For more information about the Ivy Brain Tumor Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, please visit the center's website at ivybraintumorcenter.org. For us here at the Ongezien Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners and underwriters, for your ongoing support. Thanks to your support, our program now has a wider reach with distribution via iHeartRadio, in addition to PRX Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. You can also download our program via iTunes. In Arizona, you can listen to the Onkosin Brief via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. For more information about that, check out our online journal Onkosin at www.onkosin.com. You can also find Onkosin at Facebook or Twitter. If you like the Onkosin Brief and you want to help us make this program possible, Visit our online journal Ongezien and click on the link The Ongezien Brief. Here you can find more information on how you can support this program. And your support of this program is really important. It allows us to bring you interviews with experts involved in the development of novel diagnostics and new treatments. And if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER, C-A-N-C-E-R, to 66866. And we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all. And thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofland, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949 923 1660 or visit our website at oncazine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.